Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm really, really delighted to be here. I'm just so impressed with the uh, energy and the organisation and the enthusiasm for uh, STS and for moving it forward in, in very interesting ways. Um, I'm going to be talking about what STS means for business and technology. And this is a title which Oleg uh, came up with and, and, and gave me. Um, I uh, entirely uh, refute Oleg's earlier suggestion that uh, we are becoming less academic as we go through the afternoon. Um, for me, what's so interesting is that you can do very academic, very academic STS, and you can engage with business at the same time. And this is very much in the spirit of the rather peculiar business school that we have at Oxford University. It attempts to integrate real world activities with very academic uh, research at the same time. Okay, so um, what I'm going to do is to give um, briefly yet another version of what counts as um, STS, um, then move to talking about whether STS means business. Um, I'm going to use an old um, concept uh, from STS, the certainty trough, to help us try and make some sense of this, and then finally um, end with a few um, suggestions. So what is STS? Well, I think it's become clear probably that STS has no single theory, method or perspective. It's a huge multidiscipline which draws on and contributes to sociology, history, anthropology, economics, communication, psychology, philosophy, to name but a few. It draws on and contributes to multiple intellectual currents, including relativism, constructivism, actor network theory, anti and post decisionism feminism, post-feminist studies and all the rest. I think what's really nice about it is that it, is, uh, it has no consensus, that it is a multidiscipline which is productively in dispute with itself, and it is a multidiscipline which is continuously reinventing itself, continuously coming up with new and different perspectives on STS, despite what some of our, us um, older rockers uh, persist in, uh, in, in, in going on with. Okay, so... Um, Talking a bit about what the value of SDS could be, well, it seems to me that SDS is basically a set of provocations. It is a whole series of perspectives and, and approaches, uh, which include uh, those ones enumerated there. Um, is it uh, giving us the truth about what really happens in science and technology? No, that would be um, uh, particularly egregious, it would be particularly self-contradictory to assume that we SDS has had the truth, even though none of the scientists we study have the truth. What SDS is, is a fund of examples, stories, case studies, research reports, which can organise and or stimulate thinking, sometimes change thinking entirely. There is some interesting literature in management which looks at the relationship between management academics and management consultants and gurus. And what it discovers is that the findings of management academics are of no use to consultants whatsoever. That often those findings and the things which consultants perpetrate um, are often give a negative effect on the management um, that, they want to, that they want to carry out. So what then is the purpose of the relationship between um, management and management consultants and gurus? And the answer is, it's about telling stories. It's about swapping stories. It's about having narratives to speak to each other. It keeps the world moving around if you have anecdotes and examples and so on. That's what makes um, that particular um, uh, relationship work. I think it's also potential for a productive relationship between SDS and its gurus and consultants. SDS I think of as no one thing, you can't pin it down, it's impossible to say what it is, but it is a set of sensibilities which includes some of these things. It has a propensity to cause trouble, provoke and be awkward. It has a preference to work through difficult conceptual and theoretical issues using very detailed empirical case studies, exactly the point that Andy was making earlier. It has an inclination to deflate grandiose concepts and claims. So um, when, when philosophers talk in grand terms uh, about concepts, um, there is STS to knock them down and open them up. It emphasises the local, specific and contingent. 
and it is cautious about the unreflexive adoption and use of standard social science lexicons like power, culture, meaning, value, social forces, social influences, social institutions, and so on. And it gives great reflexive attention to frequently unexplicated notions of audiences and so on. At the heart of this STS scepticism for me is a slogan. And it's a slogan which I, uh, I try to repeat to myself daily. When things get tough, which means I'm getting sucked into believing that something is just the way it is, I always say to myself, it could be otherwise. And if you can always say to yourself, it could be otherwise, then you are a, quite a way along the path of doing good STS. It could be otherwise converting these um, standard ideas and concepts into objects of analysis. Now, I won't go into the details of the ways of doing it, but I want, I want to hold that slide, and tomorrow in my lecture, I'll go into more detail about some of the uh, ways in which you cash out this um, it could be otherwise clause. Oh, and then I had uh, lots of really interesting examples which were designed to um, pique your imagination about how things could be otherwise, but I don't have time for that. So, does STS mean business? Well, I'm in a really interesting situation to address this uh, question because I'm doing STS in a business school. I am a professor of marketing and a professor of STS. And this combination causes great perplexity especially in particular situations. Um, I, was, I was telling Vincent last night that, particularly in France, the idea of being a sociologist of some kind and a professor of marketing is completely, um, completely difficult um, to understand. The business school, as being part of Oxford University, is about producing top quality academic research, but it does that in a near market situation. That is, it has engagement with people who are in business, who are in the business of growing science, developing technology, and so on. So being in the business school means that you can do STS in collaboration with key national, multinational, global companies. You can develop relationships with those organizations through research, through students, through training, outreach, through policy initiatives. And you can engage in a mode two oriented research as well as a mode one oriented research, if you know the distinction, um, which moves one away from academic disciplinary um, silos. So my conclusion to the question, which I'll give you in advance, is that STS needs business and vice versa. And it needs it in the sense that it is extremely intellectually stimulating challenge as to how one relates to business. And one of the... Um, things that we did at the business school in recent years was to run a, a series of conferences with the title Does STS Mean Business? And this is published now in organization uh, in 2009. I actually have a copy of this here if anyone wants to, 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 to grab it um, afterwards. And in that uh, publication um, uh, we go into a number of issues with it. But let me, just, let me just say a bit more about the kinds of collaborative projects which being in a business school uh, generates. Um, it, gives us collaborations with scientists and technologists, so uh, I've been involved in, in, in projects which look at the exploitation of innovations. I've been ex involved with um, technology development companies like Research Machines. Um, I serve on the um, council of the major consumers association um, in, uh, in the UK, which is called WITCH. Um, I've worked in, in, in lots of um, trans-European collaborative projects. Um, which are about how to evaluate R&D outputs, um, how to uh, build uh, different kinds of transportation infrastructure, and the most interesting one recently, um, I've got into neuromarketing. I don't know if anyone knows what is neuromarketing, uh, and um, if you take me aside afterwards, I will explain at length. But basically, this project is about how the neurosciences are affecting uh, business and uh, many other disciplines as well. This brings me also, uh, in, in this position, into contact with um, projects which have to do with developing brands in African economies. Um, you know, how, can we, how can we revise the brand Nigeria? Because when we think of Nigeria, we think of scams, corruption and violence. What can we do to produce an alternative brand for Nigeria? Um, I'm in very involved with um, uh, an extraordinary entrepreneurial company called World Executive uh, that, that, that works in brand valuation. And I've been involved in various times with uh, technological development and social impacts in numbers of major uh, global internationals. So 
The main approach which I'm keen on here is um, what I call ethnography, um, or what has more recently been called technography. With ethnography, you do not take for granted what the natives tell you about their culture. You are sceptical in your recording of the ethnos. You graph the ethnos sceptically. With technography, you record the technology sceptically. You graph the technology. You don't take for granted what the natives tell you about the technology. So this involves close observation of business and technological development in practice. It involves adopting a sceptical stance and it involves a sceptical stance. Uh, it involves observing and contributing to the situation you're in as it happens. And as I think has been mentioned already, it's now the case that major multinationals employ ethnographers. So Xerox Park have done, Intel does, Microsoft does, Schoenberger has done. And there are now a series of industry-based conferences based on STS ethnography in, in industry. So EPIC, which is the, um, and I can't remember, the ethnographic practice in companies. EPIC runs annually and is an is a, is initiative sponsored by Intel and Microsoft. We have new modes of exploring the relationship between STS and business and technology through the use of what's now called Studio STS and initiatives like um, Insight in the UK or the Virtual Knowledge Studio um, in Holland. Okay, does STS mean business? Well, first of all, I mean, I should, um, I'm sorry this is difficult for the interpreter properly, but um, the, there's a double sense of mean business in English, which means, is STS now taken seriously enough to make a difference? Is it not just playing around, but it means business? And the second sense, of course, is, can STS make a difference in business and management? And um, what you find as a result of that is STS involvement in many different disciplines. And you find, for example, that in organization and management, many of the scholars are using STS um, concepts. Within STS, there is a healthy disagreement about the effects of engagement. Is this a good thing or a bad thing? Um, and uh, the example I, I said, I quoted in my question in the earlier session from Michael Guggenheim, he said it's absolutely suicide if we give up our core focus on science and technology. We must, as a discipline, focus only on science and technology. And when we have reliable, repeatable, uh, concrete news about science and technology, then we might be able to sell it to, to business. And my response to that is, of course, it's very unusual to find any situation in the world where people sell things which they have a definitive product of and very frequently, and especially in IT companies, they sell you stuff way before it's been produced. Another complaint is that the proper job of STS is to eschew utilitarian and emancipatory uh, demands. So Mike Lynch is very strong on the purity of STS, and the pure STS does not allow itself to be sold across the, across the border, down the river, to mere industrialists because its purity will in some ways um, be threatened. Um, an example of this is that the, um, it turned out that laboratory life was cited in a, very, uh, in a major court case in the US and it, it made the difference between uh, somebody was being sued for uh, copyright and laboratory life was cited as proving that scientists do a lot of copying. Right. Nowhere in the book do we once mention the word copying, copyright. Are we then to conclude that this is a misuse of STS? Or is this a line of argument which has been productively stimulated by an inquiry which actually said nothing on the topic at all? Science is now inescapably big, big business. It cannot, you cannot think of science without thinking of investment and, and growth and big business being involved. Successful engagement does not mean dissipation of radicalism. Simon Cole has some very nice um, uh, papers on what it's like to be an STS expert witness. S Simon Cole is employed by the defense in a court to show that the claims made by scientists are socially constructed. 
So he's an, he's an ideal witness for the defence. He's used as a kind of jobbing social constructivist to show that that's the case. Now, it's interesting stories about the authority of his witnessing. Um, in one particular case, um, the judge, when they, uh, before the trial begins, they assess the quality of the expert witness. And the judge said to Simon Cole, you say you're, you've got a PhD in STS. What, what is STS? And Simon Cole tried to explain, but unsuccessfully, what is STS. And the judge, the judge says, well, where did you get your PhD? And Simon Cole said, Cornell. And the judge said, ah, that's OK. <laughs> and the point it makes is that we cannot proceed as if we have an intrinsic essential kernel of what STS actually is, and it's that that makes the difference. We're in a much more interesting and complicated relationship. So I've given you the evidence of, of, of a laboratory life. Okay, now I think some of the ways to try and think through this um, are quite interestingly um, uh, given to us if we, if we recall um, a very early episode in, um, in, 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 in techno science, thank you very much, um, which is the uh, device called the Certainty Trough, which was in a book uh, produced by Donald McKenzie uh, before he got into finance. And this is his book about inventing accuracy. It's about attempts to measure the accuracy of inter inter intercontinental ballistic missiles. And what um, Donald McKenzie shows quite beautifully, but just in the space of two pages in this long book, and he doesn't come back to it at all, is that the distribution of ideas about accuracy um, is very complicated. It's socially distributed. So the left-hand axis you see there, um, the y-axis, is increasing uncertainty. And the x-axis is the social distance from the site of production. And you see you get a u-curve. And the scientists and technologists nearest the site of production are pretty uncertain about these measures of accuracy. High uncertainty here, the people really don't believe very much the kind of accuracy they're getting. But further away from the site of production, you get a whole bunch of people who believe in the accuracy of the measures which are being made. And then further away, you get people who really don't care, they're not involved at all. So what's going on here? Well, in English, we have this phrase, absence makes the heart grow fonder. The further away you are, from the site of production of the technical fact, the more confident you are in it. I mean, it's a kind of slight, slightly counterintuitive um, idea. Uh, and who are the people who are keen on, uh, who, who, who are more certain than the scientists themselves? They were the generals, the politicians, the media, who knew for sure that the Soviet missiles were deadly accurate even though the scientists themselves were pretty uncertain about the measures of the accuracy. So you have a very nice um, uh, a dis distribution of certainty like that. Um, now you can, you can apply that to lots of different things. What I think is so nice about this is a nice reminder about the ways in which these things are distributed. You can apply it to, for example, to my own study of the development of a new line of computers for education. I did an ethnography of a company in the UK who was producing computers for education. And on the days that I was in the company there, it was a mess. The people delivering the case had gone bankrupt. The, the access times to the hard disk were way down on spec. The manager who was leading everything had been taken off to deal with another product, and it was, it was just terrible. On days when I was back in the university, I told people about what a wonderful machine was being developed by this company that I was studying. There was even one occasion where I found myself giving out brochures about this new computer. So the difference between these two things is very important. And this is about the ethnographic wear and tear. If you're doing ethnography, you are slogging up and down this slope the whole time. It's tough. You are changing your way of thinking about what the particular uh, machine is. And I should just say that the um, obvious aim of the developers of the new technologies uh, is to make that trough as wide and deep as possible, right? And um, you want to know how to do it? Um, well, it's a marketing question. And the question has to do with how you control the shape of that curve. 
and the, the things you put in, in place to do that. And if, if you want to know what things to put in place to control the shape of that curve, I'm, I'm afraid that's another consultancy um, from, from the, the marketing professor, and I'll, I, but I can, I can talk to you about that later. Okay, so certainty about the technology varies. The reception and use of the technology is socially distributed. There's an enormous capacity in this for misconstruing what users want. The users of the technology need to be taught what to want. And the robustness of the technology depends on the success in configuring the users. Configuration requires ethnographic travel. If you neglect your ethnography, this can lead to insularity, lack of certainty and product failure. Now, what's interesting is that this has potential application to all cultural artefacts. Supposing, how many minutes? Okay. Supposing we now think of this as the certainty trough for STS. At the coalface, let us admit it, we're not entirely sure not entirely confident in the kind of things that we're producing and writing. However, on public occasions, we tend to trot out versions um, of STS to an audience with, with three, which we like to configure. Supposing this is the work of STS and these are our partners in business and technology development, then something very similar applies. We need to be able to configure our users to make them more confident than perhaps we are about some of the things we are saying about STS. So I think there's a very interesting uh, set of questions which arise which are productive in terms of applying the certainty trough to our own situation in trying to relate to, um, to, to business and technology. Okay, so, um, and obviously there are you know, variations of the trough. You think of that top line um, it's the line where people uh, outside of the producing uh, arena are even more uncertain than the people inside. It's a disaster. The flat line is something equivalent to my elderly aunt. The flat line is somebody who says, well, I don't really understand what you're doing anyway, dear. And you have no certainty trough whatsoever. She's not impressed with what I do in work and so on. And you get increasing robustness as the trough gets deeper and lighter. Okay, so just to close, if I may, with some um, suggestions. Um, it seems to me we have to take very seriously ideas about the relationship between the productions of technology and its uses in trying to understand how we relate if we want to, to business and technology. It's very important, it seems to me, that we supplement, perhaps even replace, the linear models of development which still dominate thinking in how it is that you get ideas out of the lab into production and so on. And instead of that, um, you need to supplementing that with, with ideas about STS inquiry. For me, STS inquiry, which gets right near the bone of this, is about ethnography and in particular this variant technography. So my suggestions are train dozens of STS ethnographers and you can do that please at, um, at the European University here. Provide executive education in STS for corporate executives and technology developers and you have the structure to be able to start doing that. Develop collaborative ethnographic research in business and technology development settings, perhaps in the Skolkovo Institute. Thank you very much. Well, there's a clear Are there any burning questions which people would like to address to Steve, or should we go with another presenter? question. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I, I've just taken the slide down. But uh, no, what's more interesting about the certainty trough is that what you believe in about the certainty trough varies according to where you are on the curve. Yeah. <laughs>
Oh, I think I think it goes a long way to getting me out of it. No, no, I think I think that's uh, uh, certainly has that variability about it. But no, I mean, except the point. This is this is um, uh, a two-dimensional probe. It's a two-dimensional stimulus to get us thinking differently about the relationship between STS and the outside. And I think it, I think it affords um, you know all those difficult questions, which I'm very happy to uh, pursue.